It's been about six months since I made a video. I was thinking coming up to the new year that I'd like to be doing sort of one a week, and since we're now nearly in February, that's not gone so well. But today we've got this to install. This is a VFD, Variable Frequency Drive, and Phase Converter. So this goes from single phase to three phase. This is the YL620A. So you can see the sort of very brief specifications on here. Uh, the YL620A, 2.2 kilowatt, 220 volt. Uh, AC 220 volt in, 240 volt, 50 60 hertz. And the output's 10 amps or 4 kVA, so a shade over 10. 10 amps, really sort of 10 and a little tiny bit. Before we get into discussing you know, the features of the, the unit and getting it wired in and installed, we're going to go over a little bit of theory. The top graph that you can see in front of you is a single phase AC waveform. It starts at zero volts, climbs to 240, drops to zero again in the middle of the cycle, then down to minus 240 and back to zero at the end. And that's one full cycle. It's about 0 0.02 seconds or 50 times a second, that's 50 hertz. And you'll see that our x-axis here is defined in degrees, not in milliseconds or seconds. The second of the graphs is three phase. You can see that we have three sine waves. So we've got L1, a blue line, L2, the gray line, and L3, which is our orange line. And they're all the same waveform, but they're phase shifted. And this is where the degrees come in. So each cycle is essentially a circle, 360 degrees. And these are phase shifted by 120 degrees. So 90 to 210, 210 to 330. So instead of two cables, cables coming in, you have three cables. There are three phase and neutral circuits, but for us, we only have you know three phase motors. We're just running three cables on Earth uh, from the VFD to the motor. And so our VFD takes this and turns it into this. Kind of. It's not not really that simple. This is a crude representation of what the VFD actually does. So instead of producing a sine wave output, which is our orange line here, it actually produces a square wave. It's pulse width modulated, which means that essentially it varies the frequency of the voltage output to approximate the waveform. So this graph is a little rough, it's a little misleading. So these steps here are all equal widths. In fact, they should be different because that's the frequencies, this, this direction here, and that's the amplitude going up. So ideally, you'd, what you'd see is this would come along, drop all the way down to zero, have a short gap and come back up again, come across, back to zero, short gap, come back up. And you see they'd kind of get gradually longer uh, as you go along. But it took me long enough to figure out sine waves and square waves in Excel, so I wasn't really uh, willing to put another day into graphing all of this out. But that gives you a rough idea of what you'd see if you had an oscilloscope hooked up. You'd see a series of steps. The amperage actually forms a, we're talking about volts here, so the amps actually form a sawtooth pattern around the sine wave. And again, I wasn't graphing that either. But that should give you a rough idea of what's actually going on inside our VFD and what we can expect from the output it, and really how it controls the speed of your motor. If you've ever played with an Arduino, one of the first experiments that you do, uh, if you go through um, the tutorials on the Arduino website, is pulse width modulation control of an LED. And it's essentially exactly the same principle. If you want the LED brighter, you turn the voltage on for longer. If you want to dim it, you have uh, you lower the frequency, so you put out pulses of voltage, and there are bigger gaps if you want dimmer, and shorter gaps if you want it brighter, until you go all out to constant voltage. Now that we've had a look at how the VFD actually works, we can take a look at the unit itself. It comes with a manual, and that's it. There's nothing else uh, in the box, just this and the manual. The manual is English. It's not a great translation. Most of it is you know, easy enough to follow, but when it comes to the wiring diagrams, there are some things which have been mislabeled or mistranslated. Uh, likewise, the settings section, which 
I've actually got a printout here, and this is a better translation of the few things highlighted. This runs to about 12 A4 pages, or is it 8 A4 pages, I beg your pardon. And I'll post a link to that in the description and a better manual for this as well, because they're both um, just better translations of, of, how it, of uh, what the manual should say. I do also have a short list of settings, so this is like the essential stuff. And we'll come to that when we set this up. So if you have a look around the unit, pop the manual out of the way, the growing, growing pile of uh, booklets and bits of paper uh, to my left. This is the top. We have a cooling fan that draws air through from the bottom. You can take that fan out. There's no filter in here. So it might not be a bad idea if you're in a dusty environment to just get a bit of um, filter material, a computer case fan filter or something, and pop it in there. You can pop the fan out, and that reveals the heatsink below. And that's a fairly chunky bit of aluminium, presumably aluminium. My other VFD is all metal at the back here. It's all heatsink, this whole section, the whole back end. Not so with this one, but to be fair, this is a 2200 watt unit. We're only using it on a 1100 watt motor. We've got 100% headroom, so I'm not overly concerned. We turn on its side, we've got a grill. The other side is the same. And another grill at the bottom, obviously the airflow is going through that way. And at the bottom here we have a label for our power terminal. So live neutral, WVU, ground, and the braking resistor, which you can fit. We'll talk about that in a little bit. We're not fitting a braking resistor. Um, oh, these are these cable entry grommets are actually, you know, they're, they're quite nice and soft. The HY VFD that I've, I used previously, or I'm, I'm using now using on the lathe, does have cable entries, but they're rock solid, so they're not much good at um, sealing anything. But yeah, so you could cut across those lines and use that as a cable entry. We're probably not going to do that. Same with the one at the front. These holes are not wide enough to take a cable gland, unfortunately. I did try that. I did think perhaps I could get away with mounting this up without putting it in an enclosure. I came to the conclusion that I was going to need a button box for it anyway, so it wouldn't really matter. But my first thought was to mount this up on the mill and just have a couple of cable glands, so you know, if you power in and out, and controls, or even just to control it from the VFD. But you can't do that. Well, you could drill these out, but we're not going to do that. We're going to put this in a proper metal enclosure. So we probably won't use the the little cable entry covers there, the little grommets, because to be honest, the, uh, the enclosure's sealed anyway. You can probably just about make out the power terminals through there, but we'll take a closer look at those when we take the cover off the front here. So let's take a look at the front panel. You have run and stop, forward reverse, all fairly obvious. Display changes what you see on the display here. You have up and down, and these either change the displayed setting or run through the programming menu. So the programming menu, click that. All of the programming settings are selected by, by number. They, they go like a serial number. And you can go through them and select them with the uh, either the up and down buttons to go consecutively, or you can hit the program button, click up to the number you want, click to the next one, click to the next one and uh, set those. They're all four, four number, I think, uh, codes. And set simply saves the settings that you've entered. You also have this little knob here, and that is for adjusting the frequency or whatever's displayed on here. So whether it's um, frequency or RPM. I don't like this. It's, uh, it's a very jittery potentiometer. I would have rather have seen a encoder on there probably have one in your car stereo you can just turn and turn and turn and turn it infinitely in either direction and what an encoder does is it sends a signal to the circuit obviously the processor that says you're either turning left or right i would much rather have seen one of those because this is not a nice pot and it's wobbly and everything it's just not not great but i mean it'll work uh it'll work just fine but it, it just doesn't feel very nice so now we've had a look at the actual front panel. Oh, actually, before we do that, you can pop these off. 
So I have 3D printed a mount for this. It's not for this one, it's actually uh, my other VFD. I printed two, that's why I have a spare. And it does fit this. So the temptation was to put this in a really big enclosure, uh, run this cable through the front, and this is what I'd, I'd done previously. Uh, put this on a mount, and then plug it all in and close the door and it's all out of the way. We're not doing that this time. We're just going to have the VFD sticking out the front of the enclosure. I'll show you how that works in a little bit. But first, let's take a look at the terminal. So we pop the front cover off, and you need to do this for the installation. I'm not taking the whole thing apart, though you can. These aren't really that difficult to disassemble. It's all just screws. There's no, uh, there's no odd fasteners to stop you from taking it apart. Because if you really want to get, get deep in there and see how it works, you could do that. So there we go. These are our control terminals. And if I prop this up, maybe we could use that. Perhaps not. I'll hold it up and grab something to point with. I had a pencil here somewhere earlier. So these are our control terminals. On this side, we have these three terminals here. So common, normally open, normally closed. This is a relay. There's no power to the relay itself. So you can set this relay to open or close based on various conditions but you have to supply power to the common from, or, well, you can go the other way. If you have to supply power to the common, then tie it to ground. And you can use this 13 volt terminal here for that, depending on, obviously, what voltage you want to run. If you have something in there that's five volts, you want to run off of that relay, you have to supply it yourself. But uh, built in, this has 13 volts, 10 volts. And I think, there is a 15 volt on here, I think, yeah, it's XVCC. I don't know if that's voltage in or voltage out. I'm assuming that's voltage out. AO is the analog voltage. Sorry, analog, analog out. The AO ground and 10 volt, those are for your potentiometer. So if you want to mount one of these pots externally on an external control board, those are the three terminals you'd need. So you've got 13 volts there, just do what you like with. The VL1, if I grab the manual a second, my memory isn't perfect. The VL1 is, I beg your pardon, the 10 volt VL1 and ground are all for the pot. Shift that out of the way again. So yeah, AO, Sorry, VL1, AO, and 10 volt are all for potentiometer. Yeah, that works. Okay, got it now. And then, yeah, 13 volt, do what you like with that. 15 volt, X ground, which I presume is for XBCC, but. But should that matter? I wouldn't have thought so. I thought they would just be tied to ground. We'd have a look at the board, actually. If I can see the traces on the board, you probably won't be able to see them. Um, ah, no, right, so X ground is for, X ground is for these terminals here. So forward, reverse, X4, 3, 2, and 1. These terminals, X1 through 4, can be repurposed as, well, a variety of things, but typically they'll be for control switches. So forward, reverse, uh, emergency stop. There are a ton of settings in the manual uh, for the conditions that those can, or functions that those can trigger, and that can trigger whether they're on or off. So, you know, if a connection is open or closed, you can sort of set that. They are, those conditions are fixed, so you, you can't write your own, but they are in there. We'll, we'll take a look at those in the manual uh, when we come to actually wiring our switches up. So I've got those written down on the sheet. Obviously reverse and forward, so again, you can set whether these are open, closed, whether they are momentary or whether they have to be held. So if, for instance, you wanted a forward reverse switch, like a drum switch, where you've got forward, off, 
reverse. You'd set these so that they took an in or that, so that the input was active when the switch is in a certain position, so when it's on. For our purposes, we're probably going to use momentary switches, so it will be a case of a, if I remember rightly, the switch goes in, the, the uh, you have forward, switch, ground, and when you make a contact, momentary contact, switches the motor on, and then you can push the brake with uh, one of these, so use a, you know, a normally uh, closed switch. And when you want to turn it off, you just break the connection. You can probably do it the other way around as well. But since we want to use the emergency stuff, and that will probably have to be wired through that, I prefer that to be normally closed. So when you hit the switch, the e-stop, it locks in the open position. So MO is a triode output. And NC here is apparently empty. Apparently it doesn't do anything. Now, again, I don't know if you'll be able to see, but it doesn't look to me like there are any traces going from NC to anywhere else, unless they go below the board, but all the traces for these go over the top, or at least are visible from the top. There's no trace visible from that one, so presumably that is, um, doesn't go anywhere. Yeah, I don't think so. There's also a set of jumpers in here. So there's another there's another connector that's a RS four eight five I think port. There is a set of jumpers here. I think these are I I read in the manual that there is a section for setting these, but I couldn't find it. Might have to have another look. I don't think that's going to concern us for our installation, but for sort of CNC machines and things, it very well might. So bear in mind that. However you set things up is going to be dependent on what you're doing. And don't just follow this video and, and think you're going to set up and it's all going to work. If you're setting up for a mill, it should do, but um, if you're setting up for something else, it may well not. But you know, if you're just, just powering a motor, this should be fine. But there is a ton of other stuff you can do with this. So anyway, we've got our power terminals down the bottom here. So we've got live, no, neutral, live, W, V, U, we have ground or earth, and we have a terminal for a braking resistor. There is a table in the back of the manual that deals with braking resistor sizes. I think for this it's a 10 watt braking resistor. Uh, it will be a big, big thing, you know, huge. And I haven't found a need for one of these previously, so. I did set up the braking on my other VFD, my HY VFD, tried it out on the lathe, I was running it at quite high speed, set the braking to be fairly, or what I thought was fairly short, you know, so it would, it would spin down and stop fairly rapidly. What actually happened was I spun the lathe up, hit the stop button, it stopped almost instantly, the chuck unscrewed and flew across the room. Bear in mind that was running at about 2,000 RPM, something like that. And that was a 8 inch chuck. Put a nice big dent in the lathe bed. Narrowly missed me. Put a hole in the concrete floor. Bounced over the crane. The crane was out at the time. And ended up over by the front window. So it went from one side of the workshop to the other, about 20 feet. Before it hit the wall, and that stopped it. So be careful with braking. It's not such a big issue if you've got something that's held in by a drawbar or if you have a, la a lathe chuck with a collar on it, you know, uh, or a, a cam lock, something like that, or a, or a D0 or something that holds the chuck in. But if you have a threaded nose on your lathe spindle, you might find that if you, you brake too aggressively, it will um, it will sling the, the chuck off the lathe. As entertaining as that is, I'd rather it didn't happen too often. So we may not, we probably won't bother with a braking resistor. I don't have one to hand anyway. It's probably something I'm not going to be too worried about. Now these terminals, actually I'll pop that back open again. These terminals you probably want fork crimps for. We'll be using ring crimps, which I've got 
I made up a cable earlier. So we've got a cable here. And we're going to plug this in and test it before we go and rig it up to the mill. So you would imagine being a sensible kind of person that I would have tested this before I started making a video. I did. So yeah, we're using the wrong crimps, but that's okay. That's actually all right. It will still work. I'll say they're the wrong crimps. You know, they fit just fine. It's not um, it's not really an issue. It's not like uh, that's going to cause us any problems. They're just slightly less convenient. So if we drop that in there through our cable entry and screw that down. The one thing I would say is when it comes to wiring in your earth cable, you're probably better off running one cable from the earth terminal to a terminal block. So what we'll probably do is put what we'll probably do is put a bit of DIN rail in the enclosure and then stick some terminal blocks on there and run our earth so we we'll have to trim some of this sheath back on the um, on our cable. But we'll probably run this earth cable to we'll probably run this earth cable to a terminal block. A series of terminal blocks on the dim rail. And plug all our earth cables in there. Now there are plenty of terminals on here, so you've got one on the block there and one on either side. But if you're using crimps, these are fiddly. They're, uh, they're a little difficult. So I'd prefer to run them all to a common point and then just run one cable to this terminal here. So now that we've got that done, we've got our terminals nicely exposed. We're going to plug this thing in and test it. We've got all our crimps screwed in, so we'll get the plug in the wall. Turn this on and make sure that it works. There we go. You can see it takes a little while to start up. Now this is our frequency setting, so you can see if I turn this, that will change the frequency. And for some reason that's topping out at a thousand, a thousand hertz. Is that definitely frequency? Yeah, so we need to change that. We've got a whole list of settings here actually that we need to change. We may as well do this while it's on the bench because we're going to do these anyway. They need to be done. Might be a little difficult for you to see, but if we go to the program menu, so hit the program button, that brings up P000, which is the first one. That's our line input frequency. So if you press set, that will take us into the setting. And our line input frequency is set at, if I tilt this forward, there is a decimal point there, is set at 100, which it isn't. Unfortunately, we can't set this with this sort of thing about having an encoder. If we had an encoder, they could have done it so that you could do, you could run through the program menu, and you could do your settings with one thing. It would be easier. Anyway, what we can do is hit the program button again. Oh, okay, it doesn't work that way on this one. So we set, and so can I? Yeah. Okay. So. On this unit, the display button cycles through the digits. I didn't expect that because it doesn't do that on on my HYVFD. And we can set this to 50. And that's our input frequency. And press set. And that's programmed. P001 is the start stop command source. So this is about whether it's controlled from this panel or an external panel. We're going to leave that alone for now because until we've got a few buttons hooked in, 
we'll still need to use this. And in fact, the only thing that's going to change, there are three commands that are going to change on here, the forward, reverse, run, and stop. But the way we can set it is that the commands to the uh, the input terminals are active, but the commands on the, sorry, the buttons on the front panel are still active. So it's not either or, you can do it as both. You can set it as either or. In fact, I've got the options here. So the first one is the VFD control panel, which is this. If we were to go up to option one, so if we go to set, it's on zero. If we went up to option one, that would be external control panel with the stop button still active. Two would be the same, but with the stop button inactive. Three would be a Modbus control. And four would be user application control. I'm not really entirely sure what that means. That's some kind of a sort of custom input. But for now, we're going to leave that at zero, and we will change that when we come to actually plugging our switches in. So if we go set, that's done. Next is P003. So if we go into that, we have three stopping modes that we can choose from. Zero is decelerate to stop, one is coast to stop, and two is use DC braking resistor. Now, I think the difference is that Decelerate means that it will use some braking, whatever it's got on board. Coast to a stop means it will just switch the motor off and let it run. And use DC braking resistor means it will shunt any uh, any current that comes back through the uh, unit to the braking resistor. I think that's how it works. My, I stand to be corrected. If I've got that slightly wrong. Okay, so we want to leave that at zero we don't have a braking resistor and we don't want it just to coast. So four, which is what it's looking at now, P004 is the maximum output frequency. Now we've got that set at 100 hertz. For now, I think we want to set that at 50. And this is, oh, I've selected the wrong digit, haven't I? There we go, it's 55. If we flick through to the next one, that's 50. Set. P005 is the maximum output voltage frequency. I'm not entirely sure what that's about. But the default should be 50, so we'll see. Let's uh, have a look at that. And it's not. Okay, so set it to 50. Set. Six is the maximum output voltage. So if we set that 100% it's fine. The middle frequency, middle voltage, minimum frequency, minimum voltage, I don't, I think they're to do with voltage curves. So we can have a look at that. So that's 40, uh, 40 hertz. Is that 40 hertz? What are we on six? Maximum output voltage, middle frequency. 40 hertz well the battery gave out I think we were on P008 so we'll start from there if we bring this back down again that's 7 go to 8 and set that and P008 is our middle voltage now I said I think these are voltage curves but I'm not entirely sure this might be from memory you could select three speed settings so this may be the case here but I'm, I'm really not sure if you've got the maximum output frequency and the minimum frequency, we'll find out. So that's 100%, so we'll set that. P009 is the minimum frequency, so if we go to set for that, I've set that at 20 hertz. Because if that's the minimum frequency we can run down to, that's fine. And then we've got the minimum voltage, which is, is that one volt? might be a little low. So I'm going to have to have a look into exactly how these settings work, but for the moment we'll leave that at default. Uh, now we're on to 16, so we'll skip 11 through 15, which is the external start-stop mode selection. So 0 is if X5 closed, then set run direction forward. So X5 is, uh, we'd expect it to be reverse here, actually. If X4 closed, set run direction reverse. So that's kind of 
reversed. But we can figure that out. We can kind of figure, well, if we say that's x5 and that's x4. Oh, no, sorry. This is x4 and x5. Hmm. Interesting. It's probably a typo in the manual. Or I've made a typo. So it's, it's entirely possible. So it will set the run direction depending on whether that's closed or open. Oh, sorry, if one of them is closed. So if reverse is closed, it'll go in reverse. If forward is closed, it'll go in forward. So that's if you have something like a drum switch. Uh, we're probably not going to do that. I think we're going to go with momentary switches. I just feel safer that way. Setting one to go up. If X4 is open, set run direction forward. If X4 is closed, set run direction reverse. So that's for a direction selection switch. So that won't switch it on. You just flick it over whether you want forward or reverse. But it won't run. Um, so that's it's the run direction. Oh, okay, so no, it looks like they're... Yeah, okay, I think I'm... I think I'm seeing this. So th two is three wire motor control, so start reverse forward respectively. We might have to experiment with that a bit, but we'll leave that on default for the moment. We'll definitely have to experiment with that. So now we want P0308. So two, three. So that selects this, these two digits, and then these are separate. So 08. So I said I've set up a VFD before, but not one of these, not this model. And this is very different. So my HY VFD is superficially similar, and you think it all comes out of China, it all comes out of the same factories. But actually, no, this board is very different. The front panel is, the actual front panel is the same. The wiring to the front panel is different. The layout is different. The terminal is different. It's all different. So don't assume that because you set one of these up, you know exactly what you're doing with another one. If it's the same model, sure, but... Uh, with this, it still takes a bit of figuring out, even though I've done this before. So where are we? 0308, the power potentiometer minimum frequency, which seems to be set at zero. So I think we should probably change that to... I think we will go to 20 hertz for that. So we'll set that. 0309 is the maximum potentiometer frequency. So it's the maximum frequency we can set with this. Bearing in mind that, that I think this is actually different from the maximum frequency, so you can end up selecting a, a higher frequency with the clock. 100%, uh, that's fine. So those are in, oh no, those are in hertz, I beg your pardon. So actually, we want to go back down. I thought these were in percentage, but they're not. Give me a little brain fart. Right, there we go. 50 hertz, set. We now want 0403. 0403. And set that. This is the multifunction relay function select. We don't really want to set this right now. But this will determine when the relay switch is on. Actually, maybe we can set this now. So there are a whole bunch. There are 25 potential settings here. And you know, if you pause this, you can probably read them. I'm going to upload this in 1080p, so you should be able to read these from there. We won't go through all of them, but the one we want is when the motor is running, we want it to go turn on, and when the motor is not running, we want it to turn off, or vice versa. It doesn't really matter, as long as we get power that we can you know, take from one side or the other. So we'll probably go 13 volts to the common, out to whatever, and then back to ground. So if we look at this, what we want is we've got warnings for power down, low voltage, over voltage, and overcurrent. Non-zero velocity. DC brake activity. Overtalk relay. I did say I we can read these out. External interrupt fault. So forward mode, reverse mode. I don't know whether they are active when you select forward or reverse. But if you're going to do it that way, I, if you want a light for instance, a little panel lamp that tells you if you've selected forward or reverse. Not that you've switched it on, but you've selected one of the two. You're probably better off running that through your selector switch, I would have thought. So get like a, a six pole switch or something and run your, your panel lamps through that, your indicator lights. 
move time accelerating, decelerating at constant speed, active. I suppose it would have to be non-zero velocity, wouldn't it? I think so. We probably want setting number eight there. But this is one we'll have to. What we we'll have to do is hook this up to the motor and test it before we hook our panel lamps up. So I'll set that as eight for the moment. But what we'll do is when we run the motor, but yeah, we'll hook it all up with the with power. And when we run the motor, I'll put a a uh, multimeter on there and just check that we're getting uh, current flowing through there when the conditions that we want to meet are met. Okay, so what's next? So that was 040. Oh, okay, hang on. So that was 0403. I thought it was 0404. So we can set that for either of the two relay positions, which is a bit weird because surely if the relay opens, the other side will be closed? If one side opens, one side closes. That's certainly the way it looks on the manual, and there is only one. So you've got your yeah, NO and NC here. So we've set that. Let's have a look at 404 then. Can we change that? We can change that. Unless it's actually two relays and they can open and, open and close independently. The relay is visible behind there. Do you know what? When I get a pause in the video, I'll, I'll actually get a, I'll get a torch. No, you know what? Maybe we can see that from here. I can't quite see it from here. I think what we'll do, yeah, when I get a pause in the video, I'm going to have a look at that. Just get a light in there or even pop this panel off. No, we're going to pop the panel off. Get a better look at that relay because if that's a dual relay, that would be really handy. But then it would be a bit odd, wouldn't it? Because you'd have... I think if you are going to do that, you'd have four terminals there, wouldn't you? I don't know. So anyway, you are opening this up while it's all, all live. What could possibly go wrong? So I'll shift that over a little bit. And pop this to one side. So this is a HF232. Hold that up there, you can see that. And there's nothing on the casing that indicates whether it's a single relay or a dual relay. But I'm going to look that up. Okay, I read that wrong. It's a HF32F, and it looks like it's a single pole, normally open. DC relay, 3 volt DC, 4 volt, which there you go, that's uh, the spec. So no, it is, uh, which is a bit of an odd one, so how... I'm, I'm slightly confused. Anyway, we'll go on with the setup. Try not to break things as we put them back together. Not track any cables actually as well. Be careful. This doesn't go together as nicely as my HYVFD, I must say. So where were we? I'm on PO404 and we'll just leave that as default for the moment. The three is arbitrary frequency. But yeah, we'll leave that as default for the moment. So we're on 0405, so actually we want 0708. So 7, 8. That's set at zero. That's the frequency source selection. So, uh, operator board I've got written down here, which is for the uh, potentiometer there. For us, zero is fine. We're not running one of these off board because we'll have this panel visible. So, we'll leave that alone. Not P12. That's 12.00. Zero, zero. That's the rated motor current. And the rated current for our motor is 4 amps. The default for this is supposed to be 5. So that set of 15 amps is a bit worrying. Uh, there we go. 5 amps. Set. The rated motor voltage should be 1201. 
So we can set that to two full. There we go. I'm trying to go back to 1201 there. Yeah, there's no decimal point there. So set. That makes me wonder because I because I can't see from where I am. The decimal point isn't visible when it's when it's there. So that's two hundred and forty volts. Which is what I want. I want to go back to twelve zero zero. Yeah. See, there's a decimal point there. Not if you can see it. It's not visible from where I'm sitting. So. I can't see whether it's there or not. I just sort of assumed it was, and then it came up with 240. And I thought, bloody hell, it must be a uh, variable whether it's there or not. Okay, so 1202 we want. 1202 is the number of poles on the motor, as is a four pole, mo pole motor. Both of them are four pole motors. 1203 is the no load current, which is four amps, I think. Five amps. Set that at two, three, four, five amps. I might go and check that. So I think five amps is appropriate because we're running a. The motor faceplate only gives the amperage for four forty. We're actually running at two twenty, so. I think five amps is about right. Leave that there. So we're on 1204, we're giving a miss. 1205 is the converter rated current, which says 15 amps. It's not 15 amps, it's 10 amps. So there we go. We need 1206, which is the converter rated voltage. So the rated voltage is actually 220. Look at this. This is rated voltage, but surely the fact that it's 230 and the rated voltage is 220, I don't know. And 1305. Uh, so if we go to 1305. Two, three, four, five, and the VFD runtime is zero hours. So that's good. I mean, I hadn't checked that previously, and it's probably a convenient way to check whether you've got like a, a return or a used unit or something or a refurb. But anyway, yeah, zero hours on logged on there. I think there is actually a reset on here, so maybe isn't reliable. A reliable way to check on things. So now that we've Double check everything works. We've done most of our settings. We've got a few to do in relation to the offboard controls, but by and large, we're set up. We can start thinking about putting this into an enclosure. I've edited together the footage I've shot so far, and this is getting on for about 45 minutes long as the video goes. So we're going to split it into two. In the second part, we'll come back, get our VFD fitted into the enclosure along with all the electrics and uh, switches and so on, get it mounted up and hopefully you'll see it running by the end of that unless something goes catastrophically wrong. So hopefully that's been helpful so far. I know uh, there's been a little bit of uncertainty about some of the settings, but anything that wasn't quite clear in that section will be corrected in the next video because we can actually test things out and make sure they work the way that I think they do. So I'm hoping that that's been useful for somebody and uh, I'll see you in the next video.